The first 15 minutes of a game can make or break the experience, setting it up for greatness or dooming it to mediocrity. This is how the first 15 minutes made Half-Life 2. In 2004, games had finally started taking their stories seriously, but there were growing pains. Tentpole franchises failed to balance story and gameplay effectively, and oftentimes those two elements felt like separate entities. This was largely because developers relied too heavily on the conventions of old media instead of allowing video games to flourish as their own art form. New games needed to innovate and embrace what made them unique instead of barreling down old tracks. Half-Life 2 did precisely that, and it did so in its first 15 minutes. Somewhere between G-Man and Alex, Half-Life 2 manages to teach you everything you need to know about City 17, the Combine, and most importantly how to play the game itself. It accomplishes this without cutscenes, without in-game journals, without narration, and with barely any dialogue. Instead, it builds the game world and teaches the mechanics through hints and level design. A trail of breadcrumbs left behind by the developers where each crumb taken by itself means little, but when pieced together forms a complete picture. And we don't even need to get off the train at the beginning to pick up the trail. The confined space, the litter, the graffiti, they all provide a microcosm of the oppressive, decaying world we're about to walk into. And when those doors finally open, those expectations are fulfilled. City 17 is a sprawling mess of chain-link fences, ghettos, and police barricades. Everywhere you look, there's another example of violence, subjugation, or paranoia. Don't drink the water. They put something in it to, to make you forget. I don't even remember how I got here. If you take a closer look around, you'll notice a ton of payphones, CRT TVs, and other dated technology. Even though you're ostensibly in the future, most of the world is decidedly outdated and neglected. And the alien architecture, with its jagged metallic appearance, sticks out like a sore thumb, as if it had been imposed on the city like a prosthetic, leaving the existing infrastructure to rot and crumble around it. Breen's welcome address and benevolent tone contrast sharply with the harsh reality of City 17, stirring up a sense of dread and suggesting Breen's untrustworthiness. A notion reinforced moments later by the Doctor's eerily pragmatic rationalizations for sterilizing the entire human race. The playground serves an integral purpose in Half-Life 2's story. It establishes stakes in a visual and concise way by showing us what we have to lose, what will happen to humanity should we fail. Other details, like the playground, are more subtle. Some are even subliminal in nature. The train station recalls images of deportation and genocide during the Holocaust. Propaganda posters and the Cyrillic lettering on them parallel our memories of the Soviet Union. Even the architecture has an Eastern European flavor to it, inviting association with the Russian-occupied states of the Iron Curtain. And the pervasive image of Breen echoes the narcissism of despots, from Saddam Hussein to Kim Jong-il. Half-Life 2 takes full advantage of our collective subconscious, evoking the imagery of 20th century fascism and war crimes to build City 17 into the ultimate totalitarian state. But it's not enough to tell a story well. A video game has to balance narrative with mechanics. It has to teach us how to play without breaking our immersion. Half-Life 2 avoids explicit tutorial segments and opts to teach the mechanics covertly through a clever series of playgrounds, bottlenecks, and tests. The train station, for example, is filled with objects to pick up and throw around. This is the first playground, and shortly thereafter the game funnels us into our first test. Okay, Gordon. You're gonna have to make your own way to Dr. Kleiner's lab. Oh, man! That's what I was afraid of! Pile up some stuff to get through that window and keep going till you're in the plaza! Here, you're not being taught. You're just trying to escape. And because you spent all that time tossing suitcases and glass bottles, stacking a few boxes comes natural. So you passed your first test without realizing it, and in the process, climbed your first ladder, made your first jump, and were introduced to the iconic wooden crate, which will make up many of the game's physics puzzles. Oh, and did you know they can break? Immediately thereafter, you are faced with the next test. This is the first door you can open in the game, and it is intentionally left ajar. Without any obtrusive instructions, it draws your attention and suggests what you ought to do with it. Then, as if the game is quizzing you, there's another door to open right after it. This one closed, but we know what to do. This happens again and again throughout the first 15 minutes. Playgrounds, followed by bottlenecks, followed by tests. 
and then there's this. Not only does this scene teach you a new mechanic, it involves you directly in the struggle against the enemy. It's one thing to see the Combine oppressing other people. It's another thing entirely to be oppressed by the Combine yourself. Could all of this been depicted in a cutscene? Certainly. Everything could have been force-fed to the player, but at the expense of their involvement. And it's that involvement, that unbroken immersion, that makes Half-Life 2's first 15 minutes so memorable. But Half-Life 2 does make one small mistake in our books. The absurd amount of control given to the player character becomes too easy to misuse during expositional scenes and in a way that breaks continuity and ruins immersion. Half-Life 2 isn't a physics sandbox, but it acts like one at times. Valve was under pressure to showcase its new physics engine, and so they made an effort to show it off, which means we can do stuff like this, and this, and this. Stuff that, while amusing, doesn't belong in a game that wants its stories and its characters taken so seriously. It's ironic, then, that the game gives players unprecedented control and then sticks them in an overwhelmingly controlled environment. We can manipulate the world around us like no other video game character could before, and yet we are not the masters of this world. Far from it. Everything and everyone we see is under the Combine's suffocating control, and that control is made more stifling by the way Half-Life 2 rations and subverts player authority at every turn. We can go anywhere and see anything except for the places the Combine don't want us to go and the things they don't want us to see. The first 15 minutes are chock full of half-open doors, quickly closing windows, and guards blocking our view from something or someone. You get the distinct impression that the game's world is far more than what you see. That creates a compulsive experience out of Half-Life 2, and it nurtures a deep motivation to find out more, dig further, and push closer and closer to its climax. It's on, but they're always, they're always departing, but they never arrive. Welcome to City 17. Half-Life 2 was one of those high watermarks in gaming canon, a trendsetter. And among its many innovations and breakthroughs, it was perhaps its use of breadcrumb storytelling and playgrounds that made the biggest impression. Countless games have used City 17 as a template for creating setting and establishing story. Some of its descendants, games like Bioshock and Dishonored, copy it wholesale, while in others the influence is much subtler. You can even see glimpses in games like Dark Souls and Batman Arkham City. So that's our take on the first 15 minutes of Half-Life 2. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and, you know, subscribe. There's more to come. And most importantly, thank you so much for watching. See you next time.